In this first of three-part interview with Dr. Joe Rom, we discuss how dodgy offsets and double accounting are plaguing climate progress at a time when the world urgently needs to get serious about climate change. Joe Rom was the Acting Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency and Renewables in the US Department of Energy back in the 1990s, and also the founder of the now-ceased Climate Progress blog. Today, Joe is a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Science and Sustainability and Media. Part one focuses on how offsets are misused by big brand names and nation states in unregulated markets to peddle lies to the public. To access longer episodes earlier and also gain access to archive and unseen interviews with experts, please consider joining via YouTube or Patreon. In part two, we discuss how this impacts the NDC accounting systems that underpin the Paris Agreement and expose much less well-off countries to yet another form of what Joe calls climate imperialism. In part three, we discuss how COP28 does not bode well having an oil boss as the president and how all these strands come together to reinforce the notion that the UNFCCC process is set up to fail. Joe, thank you very much for taking the time. It's good to see you. With the increase in urgency, to respond to climate impacts. We're seeing increased discussion and demand for carbon offsets. Can you start by giving us a brief definition of what we mean by carbon offsets and how they're currently being used or misused? Sure. And I just came out with a big paper on on offsets. I, you know, I have been writing about this for about 15 years. And in particular, as the offset market has exploded, people have been very concerned about offsets for a long time. And but no one was paying a lot of attention. Uh, and then in 2021, it, it leaped up to $2 billion. So that was sort of what got a lot of people's attention. And what an offset is, you know, I'll just use sort of an official definition, reductions of greenhouse gas emissions from an activity in one place to compensate for emissions elsewhere. The typical transaction, uh, as it has been done for decades, is where a rich country like the United States or a rich company like Microsoft, instead of reducing its own emissions because it made a commitment to do so, pays you know a developing country like Brazil to do a project that reduces emissions instead, and then the you know richer country or company says, "Hey, we funded this reduction in emissions, so we're going to pretend that we actually did it ourselves, and we're going to use it to claim that our emissions are now lower than they used to be." And so we are offsetting our emissions. Another shorthand way to think of it is a license to pollute, right? If I pay you to cut your pollution, then I now have a license to keep polluting, right? Because I can pretend it's like a get a jail free card, right? I can claim that I'm not polluting what I am. Uh, So, you know, it kind of sounds a little dubious, you know, right off the bat. And in practice, as I said, it's become a very, very big market in part because since the Paris Agreement in 2015, where the nations of the world realized we need to go to zero, right? That we have to take the total global emissions down to, you know, quote unquote, net zero. But net zero just means we reduce our emissions as much as possible. And then whatever emissions we can't, we offset somehow. And of course, the tricky situation when you go to zero is you can't purchase offsets from somebody else because they have to go to zero too. That's sort of the big change in the market that people, you know, didn't really catch on to. And and the other the reason people use offsets as I say is so that they can go to net zero without actually going to zero. The other reason they have used them is so they can call their products carbon neutral, right? So you can say as Evian has been saying, our water is carbon neutral. Or Delta Airlines said, we're the first carbon neutral airline. Now, obviously, they're still burning jet fuel, right? So the only way they can do that is if they say, oh, well, we paid other people. You know, we planted trees and all that sort of thing. I'll just say the interaction that almost everybody who's listening has had with offsets is when you go to buy an airline ticket, right? And usually you get to press a little button that says, I'll pay a few dollars to offset the emissions that I've released by being on this plane. And usually it's it will plant some trees. And right off the bat, the problem, of course, is that, and I like to, we don't plant trees, we plant seedlings. They start out very tiny and it takes a very long time for them to suck up all the carbon that you just emitted. 
You know, so that's sort of one problem with offsets right off the bat is, hey, I'm going to pollute now and I'm going to plant this seedling. And I hope, by the way, that some bird doesn't eat it or some wildfire doesn't get it or the people aren't negligent. So the point is, there's a lot that can go wrong in an offset. And, and over the course of the last 20 years, um, academics have studied this and said people are making claims that aren't true. And uh, there have been exposés in the media over and over again. Bloomberg has done them. And, and then there was a very big expose done by The Guardian in January, the UK Guardian and Dizit and Source Materials had done a nine-month investigation of what had been viewed as very high quality offsets, which was protecting the Brazilian rainforest. And their investigation found out, and, and these were offsets, high quality offsets in theory. They were being bought by Disney and Shell and Gucci. So, you know, obviously these brand name companies hopefully are not like messing around, but the investigation found out that 94% of these offsets were in fact worthless. And the specific type of offsets are quite controversial. It is certainly a good idea that that richer countries and companies help poorer ones stop deforestation. I think we could all agree that stopping deforestation is, is a major priority. The problem is when it becomes this, we're going to quantify it and use it as a license to pollute for some rich country, because it's hard to quantify deforestation. Because if I pay you not to cut down the trees on your land, right? Well, how do I know you were going to cut them down, right? And how are, maybe you were only going to cut down half. Maybe you weren't planning to, but since you knew you could, if you said you might, you could get money. Maybe, and, and there's this thing called leakage where I pay you not to cut down your trees, but hey, the lumber company still needs the lumber. So they'll just go to the province nearby and, and cut down some trees there. So for all of these reasons, offsets, aren't really genuine emissions reductions. They tend to be very inflated tons, wildly overcredited. Like maybe you think you've reduced 10 tons, but you've only re really reduced two tons. And then there's this issue of additionality, which is the other very big issue, which is how do I know that this project wouldn't have happened anyway? This was very true in the case of renewable power, right? A lot of these projects early on were, hey, I'm going to pay you to, to build some solar or wind power. Well, that's great, but then solar and wind power became the, the cheapest thing, right, in the last 10 years. So suddenly that was the thing anyone was building anyway, right? So if this project would have happened without the offset money, then the offset money didn't change anything. So it can't be used as saying, hey, I paid for that, and therefore I deserve to be able to, to say I cut my own emissions. So, so there's this whole sea of problems, and the net result has been that we've started to see a lot of accusations of greenwashing and a lot of lawsuits. So mostly offsets were a PR thing. I could do a good, I could do this good project and say, hey, I'm reducing, uh, you know, emissions, so I'm going to pretend that I reduced my own emissions, and and I want you, the world to, you know, give me some recognition. You you should buy my product, right? Because it's carbon neutral or fly my airline because it's carbon neutral. So as you can imagine, as people have caught on that these things aren't real, you know, there have been two types of lawsuits. So there have been uh, suits in front of the advertising regulators. And so the, the Dutch advertising regulator has said to Shell, please stop making these claims about your oil sort of being environmentally friendly. It's oil, you know, st stop it. And and the Swiss advertising regulator said to FIFA, which is a Swiss company that oversees the World Cup, the, the, the Qatar World Cup had been claiming that they were carbon neutral. They weren't carbon neutral. Uh, and, and just by the way, before I forget, people should appreciate the market that we're talking about now is a purely voluntary market. There are no regulatory bodies overseeing it, which literally means that anybody could set up their own organization to issue carbon offsets. And that, by the way, is exactly what Qatar did. Because back in 2019, the biggest issuers of 
carbon offsets in the world market said, we're not going to issue any more offsets for renewable energy because guess what? It's going to happen anyway. Well, Qatar said, we're going to set up our own offset crediting firm and we're going to take all comers. We're going to issue, we'll issue credits to any renewable project, right? And by the way, we'll issue some to FIFA. And so the the whole thing with the World Cup became so bogus that it was taken, you know, to the Swiss regulator. And the Swiss regulator said, you are misleading us. Please stop using the term carbon neutral, particularly for the World Cup, because you can't prove any of your statements. So we've been seeing those suits. And now we've also been seeing actual lawsuits like the makers of Evian were sued, who that's Danone. They were sued for claiming that their uh, water was carbon neutral. Delta Airlines was sued in May, a very big lawsuit in California federal court saying, you know, I bought your ticket thinking you'd solve the climate problem. And now I learned that you haven't, you know, that sort of suit. And this has real world impact because at the end of June, Nestle's came forward and, and said, we've made a lot of promises that we're going to make all these products of ours carbon neutral, including Kit Kat, including Perrier water. And we are now withdrawing all of those claims. And we're not going to you know, uh, offsets are not going to be our thing anymore. We're going to reduce our own emissions. So I think, and I'll just, you know, I don't think any responsible company should be buying offsets and making any claims that they're using offsets to somehow make a carbon neutral product or be net zero. I don't think responsible companies should be doing that anymore. And you shouldn't be buying products that make such a claim because those claims are greenwashing. And you shouldn't worry when you buy an airline ticket <laughs> that you need to press some button. If you want to reduce your emissions, you know, don't fly, you know, get some renewable power for your home. There's a lot of things you can do that would make a difference. Spending a few bucks for trees, you know, if, if you could solve the climate problem for a few bucks, right, it wouldn't really be the kind of problem we know it is. Okay. And on that point, can you just give us a little bit of an example here of the claims of solving it for a few dollars or pounds or euros versus the true cost of removing tons of carbon from right. the atmosphere. Right now, the market for these nature-based offsets, planting, these became the most popular offsets. They're now in the range of 2 or $3 a ton. And like I said, we wouldn't be, you You wouldn't have a podcast. I wouldn't be here worried about the problem if if it was a $2 a ton problem. If you want to know what a, what a real emissions reduction costs, I think the best example in the, in the world is in fact the European trading system, right? The, e, the EU has had consistently, I think the most commitment to aggressive goals to go down to zero. And I think the EU has made clear, and, and in Germany and France, we say, we, we recognize climate's a real problem. We all need to go down to zero, and we're going to ratchet this down, and we're going to set up a trading system so that we're all making different pledges. And if one of us wants some help meeting a pledge, like Germany needs some help, they could buy some tons from France. And so the European trading system uh, the current price is about 90 euros. So it's been fluctuating for the last year between, you know, in US dollars between 80 and 100. That's a reasonable price. That's a reasonable price for, I would call the marginal cost of a wealthy European country to reduce emissions at the current level. Clearly, nobody is going to zero tomorrow, right? So the price does not reflect what it would take for Europe to be zero tomorrow. The question is, you know, what's the glide path? Are we continually reducing our emissions? And, you know, are we are we planning ahead, right? We reduce emissions using technologies we have today. We invest in new technologies that will hopefully bring the cost down in the future. You mentioned some big brand names and everyone, and I think it's almost built into our DNA, we go out and buy something. If it says on the cover that it's, it's pretty good or is green or something, we're going to be drawn to it. So putting the onus on consumers to, to not buy it because it's it's a false claim, when does that actually get outed as fraud? What's the legal boundary? Well, this is a voluntary market. So there, there's no regulatory body that could stop Cutter 
from selling those, right? There's no, there's nothing going on that's illegal, right? So there's, there's no, there's no crime except maybe a crime against, you know, human, you know, against the climate. But um, it is the wild, wild west. You know, the, uh, there's no sheriff, there's no umpire, there's no referee to call to say you get a red flag. You know, you're out of the game. So it's only the court of world opinion. And ultimately, even though you can't stop the sales of offsets, you can go to a regulator, right, and say, okay, you bought this offset, that's fine. Just don't make any claims about it. When you start saying this offset actually was a real reduction and I've used it to lower my reductions, now the regulator can say that's you, you, that's you know, that's misleading, that's bogus. So really we are talking. The, the things that can happen in the voluntary market are that consumers simply don't buy the products, um, that the media outs them, right, so you get bad press, um, or you get a regulator, or, you know, you can now, obviously, you can go to a, a, a court and say the false advertising. There Obviously, there has to be some sort of laws on the books about false advertising, but, you know, most countries at some level do. Um, even though clearly this is a murky area. Okay. Uh, but yes, th these are the things that that you can do. You know, the reason why people didn't care so much a few years ago, but they do now, is because a few years ago, the world wasn't really serious about climate change. Every country in the world was not making commitments, putting an, an inventory for everyone to see, saying, this is our starting baseline, and this is what we're going to be in five years, and this is what we're going to be in 10 years, right? Because now everything's getting serious, you can't mix the serious emissions reductions that are going to be kept track of in the Paris Agreement with these fake stuff. Because clearly, you know, this has always been the case. Whenever you have an unregulated market, it becomes a race to the bottom. This is very well known. The saying is bad money chases out good money. You know, um, if, if, if I say I'm going to sell you a, a good offset for Twenty dollars a ton, and Cutter says, "Well, I'm going to sell you an offset for five dollars a ton." And there's nobody out there. There's no reg. You know, there's no sheriff saying, "Well, this is crap and this is good." Then uh, why would I pay twenty when I can buy five? So the answer is that becomes a race to the bottom. So you can't mix a market that is meaningless and a race to the bottom with a market that is serious and is actually. Uh, you know, a race to actually reduce emissions, not to pretend and say that we did, right? We're, we're past the point where, where we can waste time with that sort of thing. Okay. <laughs>